So at this point, we should all be comfortable with the idea of contraction generating tension in a muscle cell. So let's go back to the heart. If we consider a horizontal cross section through the left ventricle, we see something that looks like this. Ignoring, of course, that the ventricular myocardium is more than just a single cell layer thick. We see the myocytes joined end to end, and we can imagine that with their contraction, as they're forcing blood out of the heart, and in this view that blood would be coming towards us, there's a tension being generated in those cells. Wall stress is simply the term we use to indicate the tension in one of those cells during systole. One of the main points of confusion when people are learning cardiac function for the first time is exactly where this tension is, and now you know. When we talk about tension during systole, we're talking about this tension that we see running through the wall of the heart. It's the tension generated by contraction. So what we're talking about with afterload, afterload is really just a term that we use to indicate how much tension is being generated in these muscle cells during the contraction. So it's another indicator of kind of the force of the contraction. Although I hesitate to use the term force because some people will relate that in their minds to the idea of forceful ejection of blood from the heart, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about kind of the force and the tension in the connections between the actin and the myosin in all these muscle cells. Okay, so it's not the force of the blood coming out, it's the force of the actual yeah, the contraction. exactly. Okay. Okay, so we're kind of good with the idea of wall stress, wall tension, afterload in that respect, right? This is a pivotal concept. So the question can be asked that if wall stress is just this tension or the force generated in the muscle cells during contraction, and we already know that the tension that's generated is dependent on how much we stretch the muscle before contraction, going back to our preload discussion, this just means wall stress is proportional to radius, right? So what we're saying is that the more you stretch them, the more afterload there is on the heart. So we have the first part of this relationship, which is afterload is proportional to radius. Afterload is proportional to radius. Now, is that all there is to it? Of course not, it's physiology. So Dr. Cornea, perhaps you can explain what else wall stress might depend on. Remember the isovolumetric contraction segment in the Wickers diagram? In order to open the aortic valve, pressure in the ventricle must be greater than in the aorta. And aortic pressure is a surrogate for blood pressure. So, if you have chronically high blood pressure, then the ventricle must generate much higher pressure, in other words, greater tension or wall stress, in order to open the aortic valve. The greater the wall stress, the higher the afterload. Would I be, you know, wrong to say the more tension you have, the higher the stress on the heart, the harder it's going to pump and the harder it's going to work? No, that completely makes sense. So this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but really why we stress so much about afterload as clinicians is that if you are forcing a heart to generate increasing amounts of tension during each contraction, so if you're forcing it to contract at a greater afterload, the heart muscle is not immortal. Eventually, things get worn out, things get tired, and you lose the ability to really have that great contraction and that's what we refer to clinically as heart failure, mm. which is a very important concept, but, but we're going to get there. Good. We okay. have to do all the physiology before we get to the, the clinical application. We finished with hypertension results in a greater afterload on the heart. I want to emphasize this does not mean blood pressure equals afterload, but the two are linked. So do not think of afterload as only blood pressure, because that'll get you into trouble. And we can see why when we think about what happens with aortic stenosis, right? Would that have an effect on afterload? Well, of course it does, because it's the same thing. Again, you have the heart having to generate this huge amount of pressure to make the blood get past these 
stiff, creaky, intransigent aortic valves, generating that increased tension, it's increased pressure, it's increased afterload. So again, aortic stenosis is something that can increase the afterload on the heart. And why I say it's important not to relate afterload to blood pressure is blood pressure is normal in aortic stenosis. In some cases, it might actually be a little bit low, but the afterload is still high. So be cautious of that. So we've said that both starting with a larger radius and then having to generate more pressure are two things that are going to increase the afterload or the wall stress of the heart. Now the logical question is, is there anything that might decrease the stress of the heart and how hard it has to work while still maintaining the ability of the heart to contract as much as necessary? I can't. So how do we normally decrease our work at anything in life? besides just not working as hard. We get some help. So what if the heart had some assistance? When the myocardium is under constant strain from a persistently elevated afterload, the body responds with myocardial hypertrophy. So in simple terms, this just means that the myocytes gain new contractile filaments to help share the load. So let's think about what happens with a game of tug of war. When you add more players, the work done by one person is decreased whereas the overall work done by the team increases. In this analogy, you can think of the team as a muscle cell and the players, the contractile elements. Now, these new contractile elements require room to work, so you end up getting an enlargement of the muscle cells, which we refer to as hypertrophy. When these new filaments are laid in parallel, as would be the case where we have a barrier to blood ejection being the main contributor to increased afterload, we get a thickening of the heart muscle, which we call concentric hypertrophy. Now, if you're interested, there's also something called eccentric hypertrophy, where the contractile elements are laid end to end, and I'd encourage you to do some further reading around that. So coming back to our discussion on afterload, we use wall thickness as a stand-in or indicator of the degree of hypertrophy. So it should make sense, therefore, that we say wall stress, or the tension in one unit of the myocardium, is inversely proportional to wall thickness. So the determinants of afterload, as we can see here in this final beautiful equation, are pressure, radius, and wall thickness. And when you put them all together like this, we get the law of Laplace, which is another famous equation. Is that a person? You know, I don't actually know. Hmm. Something to do with physics. So we've done all this physiology teaching, we know about afterload and preload. How do we put it all together? Well, we put it all together by knowing that the Frank Starling curve that we talked about at the beginning, yes, it's true, but what I didn't say back then was that it only holds true for a given afterload. By changing the afterload, like when we force the heart to work harder to contract against a stenotic valve or systemic hypertension, we shift the entire Frank Starling curve up or down. And based on your own experience with muscles and going to the gym and things like that, you should already kind of understand why. It always comes back to fundamentals and physiology. Just like we talked about the stretch on the myocytes resulting in better contraction, we also have a relationship that for any given length of muscle, so for any given stretch on a muscle cell, it's going to contract more slowly if it has to contract against a heavier load. It's going to contract more slowly if it has to contract against a heavier load. So if you think about that, it's the idea of when you're trying to lift a feather versus lifting a 100 pound dumbbell. It takes a lot longer to generate the amount of force necessary to get that dumbbell off the ground then it does a feather, and it's the same in your biceps as it is in the myocytes, of course. They're the same type of cell. Why is that? And again, it's because of cross bridges. Everything comes back to fundamental principles. If you imagine holding a weight, holding a 100-pound dumbbell, you're going to need to engage some of the cross bridges in your muscle cells to maintain enough tension so that the weight doesn't drop. And that makes sense. You can imagine lifting a weight off the ground and having to hold it there. You're going to have tension in your arm. Then when you go to actually lift it to get it up to your shoulder height or something like that, if you have only, let's say, 20% of your cross bridges left to engage in kind of cycling and ratcheting and contracting and shortening and lifting, then you can only lift it so fast as all of those myosin heads can complete their cycle. 
Cycling takes a fixed length of time because you only have a limited number of cross bridges available to engage in cycling. You're limited and you'll eventually get there, but not in the same amount of time that you would have had you had, say, 70 or 80% of your miles and heads free to rapidly cycle through the cross bridge process. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. At a higher afterload, there aren't many free cross bridges left, so actually getting the blood out of the heart is going to take longer than it would otherwise. So is that going to create plumbing problems? That's why you don't get enough blood out of the heart to keep feeding your brain and your muscles. And this brings us back to our patient that came in hypertensive. He wasn't getting enough blood to perfuse his brain. That's why he was all loopy. <laughs> you might not... Let's say not loopy. say loopy. Yeah, let's say loopy. Can I say loopy again? <laughs> muscle cells, muscle cells. When we stretch them, they work better. And when we try and make them contract against a really heavy load, they work slower. So what's clinically important is that our hearts function as they should within a given range of preloads and afterloads. So when our preload becomes beyond the realm of normal, when we stretch our heart too much, it doesn't contract that well. And this is why the heart, heart stops working. Preload to a certain point is going to improve cardiac output. But there's a certain point where no matter how much volume you give this heart, it's not going to make it work better. And you get heart failure. So cardiac function is dependent on two things we talked about. Number one being preload, number two being afterload. Preload is just another word for how much stretch is on the heart muscle prior to contraction. And afterload is just another word for how hard the heart muscle needs to work during the contraction to get the blood where it needs to be. Both of these things are based on some fundamental properties of myocytes, but what you need to remember is that in order to treat someone who's having clinical heart problems, you need to understand what their preload and what their afterload is, because we manipulate those variables every day as clinicians. And that's why it's important to really understand these concepts. Awesome.